I love it. I love it. So I'm going to talk to you this morning on the subject of grapes, giants, and grasshoppers. <laughs> Last week, I talked to you about the three T's. This week, I'm going to talk to you about the three G's. And I didn't even realize that until just earlier today when I was going over this. And, and uh, anyway, I did. And I really believe that what I've got to share with you today is a very timely message and one that's going to speak to every heart who's in here today. I'm going to give you a little context before I read my scripture. I'm going to read a passage that we honestly use very frequently around here because it's just packed full of so much rich treasure and just good things, lessons that we can learn from uh, the people of God in the Old Testament. And it's Numbers chapter 13, and in it you'll find that the people of Israel, first of all, they've been slaves for over 400 years. And so God sends a man by the name of Moses to become their deliverer and to deliver them. And so Moses goes to the people, and when he does, he comes with this message that God has plans for their future, and that he's going to bring them out of Egyptian bondage, and he does, and that he's going to take them into the promised land. He's going to take them into Canaan. I love the fact that he wasn't just taking them out of bondage and say, good luck, but how many know he brought them out to bring them in? Isn't that right? And in all of our lives, God doesn't just bring us out of whatever it is we were in bondage to. God has every intention of bringing us into the life that he has for us, and it's a good life. Amen? Canaan is a good land. It's a land that the Bible says flows with milk and honey. I'll tell you what that means here in just a moment. It's a place of promise and possibilities. It's a place where they can raise their families, and they can live, and, and uh, their lives, and they can prosper. And so the Israelites head that direction, and they arrive at the promised land. And when they do, Moses sends in 12 spies. You know the story. And those 12 spies, they are leaders from each tribe of Israel. And they're to go, and they're to spy out the land to see what the land is like, to see what the topography of the land is, the geography of the land is, and uh, what it looks like. And what kind of challenges they're going to face when they go in to possess it. And really, what life is going to be like for them once they get there. I've heard people say, and I remember whenever I was younger hearing people say that Canaan is a type of heaven. And they say that because it just sounds, you know, like it's so, so impossible for it to be a life that you realize here, this side of heaven. But Canaan is not a type of heaven. Because what we're going to discover is, is that there were giants in Canaan. And how many of you know there are no giants in heaven? How many of you are glad that when you get to heaven, you're not going to be battling giants when you get there? Amen? That will all be over, thank God. Canaan is a type of the believer's life today. And it illustrates the kind of life that God wants us to live after he saved us and after he's brought us out of bondage to sin and then he shows us what it takes to enter into and enjoy that life. So let's read Numbers chapter 13, verses 25. We're actually going to read down through verse 33, but we'll read down to verse uh, 27 here. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of Israel to the, to the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, they told Moses, we came to the land to which you sent us and it flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. Everybody say it flows with milk and honey. Say that again. And this is its fruit. Now get this, this fruit that they are showing him happens to be a cluster of grapes and it's a cluster of grapes that's so large that two guys have to carry it on a pole between them. How many, how many, that's some big grapes, isn't that right? I don't know that I've seen any, uh, you know, grapes that size or anybody, you know, any vineyards with grapes like that, but that's what Canaan had. Those grapes, what that represent 
represents to them and what it represents to you and I today is the fertility of the land and their potential success and prosperity once they're in the land. The phrase milk and honey, a land that flows with milk and honey, is an idiom, an idiom, excuse me, meaning that there's an abundance of everything that's good there. Milk and honey, an abundance of good things. Everything that you need in your life is there when you get there. So it speaks really of God's abundant provision. So after this statement, the entire tone and and trajectory of things really takes a turn, doesn't it? And we're going to discover that here in just a moment. But the first thing that I want you to realize as we move forward through the message this morning is this, is that God has grapes planned for your life. In fact, he has more grapes planned for your life than you can even imagine. Everybody say, God has grapes for me. When I say that, what I mean by that is that God has provision for you. And he has abundant provision for you in your life. You know, I don't know what kind of grapes you need, what kind of needs you have in your life. But I just want you to know God has grapes for you today. That he wants to bless you and he wants to supply your needs, whatever your needs may be. It's the will of God for you to eat the grapes. Amen? So if you need healing, and there are people in the house that I'm sure in a gathering this size that probably do need healing. God has grapes for you. If you need God to move for you financially, you need financial provision. God has grapes for you. Amen? If you're a young person and you're here today and you're believing God to find your future husband or your future wife, God has grapes for you. In fact, let's just have all the single folks. St- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Get you started off on the right foot. If you're divorced, I'm not, I don't want to leave out anybody. If you're divorced and you're thinking, can I ever be happy again? God has grapes for you. Maybe your grape is a car. Maybe your grape is a house. You need a house. God has grapes for you. And he has more grapes planned for you in your life than you can ever imagine. How do I know that? Jeremiah 29, 11, another verse, passage we use so very often. Jeremiah, God speaking through him. And it's saying, God's saying this to to them then, to us today. For I know the plans that I have for you. I got plans for you, declares the Lord. And they're good plans. They're plans to prosper you, not to get you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And plans to give you a hope and a future. Another translation says, a future that is filled with hope. A future that is filled with good things. A future, if you would, that is filled with grapes. Amen? So God has plans, good plans for your life. He has opportunities that he's preparing for you. Things that you don't even realize that are in the works for you right now. How many of you, God surprises you every once in a while by a blessing that he brings into your life that you just flat out weren't expecting? Amen? God is planning on opening doors for you. He's planning on showing you favor. He's planning on causing you to be in the right place at the right time. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord as long as you walk the path that he has for your life because the plan is on the path. Everybody say the plan is on the path. In Psalms 25 verse 4, The writer says, show me the right path, God. So in other words, there could be other paths. And we all know there are because occasionally we've gotten on them. He says, show me the right path, O Lord. Point point out the road. Point out the road for me to follow. So why does he say, show me the path, the right path? Because he knows there is a path. He knows there is a right path. And he wants to make sure that he's on it. How many of you want to make sure you're on the right path today? Amen. Amen. So God is good, and his desire for you is only good, and he wants you to have a good life, enjoy a good life, and enjoy the good things that he has for you. And that happens when you're on the right path. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, he says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. By the way, anytime you go reason with the Lord, 
You're best just to keep your mouth shut and not offer up your opinion because how many know when you're reasoning with him, the only opinion that matters is his. Isn't that right? And sir, if you're wise, yeah, you'll just listen. Yeah, I think there are people that would honestly tell the Lord, well, I know that you say that, Lord, but I just think there are people like that. I, they, anyway, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, and though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing, watch this, if you're willing and obedient, you'll, you shall eat the good of the land. What does it take for me to eat the good of the land? Well, I just need to get on the right path. I need to be willing to follow the ways of the Lord. Come on. I need to be obedient to the teachings of God's word. And if I'm willing and obedient, I'll be on that path, come on, where I eat the good land or the, the good things. Come on. So God has grapes for you, amen? God has a job for you. God has friends for you. I mean, think about all the needs people have in their life. If you're in business, God has clients for you. Come on, God has grapes for you. The path that we follow is a path that's filled with an abundance of good things that the Bible says God has prepared for us. Listen to these. These verses aren't on the screen because there's just too many verses for them to just put up there for you. But listen to the uh, scriptures here that just speak of God's abundance in our life. Psalms 31, 19, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you? Not, not just a little bit, not just enough. How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you? Psalms 36, verses seven and eight, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings, saying about this this morning, they feast on the abundance of your house. When you go to God and you go to his house, Man, you don't walk in and he doesn't have anything for you. How many know in his house there is an abundance of good things? Amen. Whatever you need is waiting for you there. Think about what Jesus said, John 10, 10, speaking about our life. He says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's all that rat does. Anything that steals, kills, and destroys in your life is never from the hand of God. It's always from the hand of the enemy. Amen? Jesus said, I've come that they might have life, that you might have life, and that they may have it how? You know, and enough to get you by while you're here. You'll have to scrape a, you know, around a little bit and struggle, but yeah, you'll, you'll make it. No. He says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Everybody say more abundantly. You know what that phrase more abundantly means? It means super abundant in quantity, superior in quality. That's the kind of life that God wants me to live. That's the kind of abundance that's available to me. Super abundant in quantity. More than enough. We need to be thinking more than enough instead of, oh God, just give me what I need. Come on. We serve a more than enough God. And superior in quality. I don't think we should live worse than the world. I think when you serve God, it ought to be obvious that you serve God and you ought to do better than the world. I made this reference last week. Uh, in Genesis 12, God makes covenant with Abram. Abram said, and he says, as for me, this is what I'll do. And the Bible says that Abram obeyed God. He took off uh, towards the land that God was bringing him into, which was a good land. And... Uh, the, one chapter later, it says that he's very rich in silver and gold and cattle and, and uh, oxen and sheep and everything else that you can think of. You know, we teach, you know, the world today, we're, we're afraid to talk about God making you rich. Oh, you're one of those prosperity churches. I sure am. We sure are. I'm a prosperity preacher. This is a prosperity church. We believe God actually wants to bless you in every aspect of your life, spirit, soul, body, physically, spiritually, financially, relationally. God just wants to bless you abundantly in every area of your life. God does not want you scraping by, struggling along. Come on. He wants to bless you. He wants you to have more than enough in your life. Maybe you don't know how to make that work yet. That's fine. I didn't know how to make it work when I first got saved. I was so broke, you know, 
I didn't have two nickels to rub together. All I had was debt. Come on. But I found out that if you live your life by the principles of God's word, come on, like Joshua said, or God said to Joshua, he said it'll cause you to prosper and to have good success in your life. Amen? And God brought us out of debt. God is to the land of even. Man, when you get to the land of even, you feel like you've arrived. Come on. And then God starts blessing you with more and more. Everybody say more and more. Come on. You believe that today? I believe it with all my heart. How are you going to be a blessing if you're not blessed? Listen to this one. This is actually about money, but it's really about everything. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 out of the Amplified Bible. And God is able... Come on, you first of all need to believe that. To make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. In other words, God says, I'm going to bless you so much that you can be a blessing to others also. Amen? Amen. To our God is a God of abundance. And you need to view your life, your future, through that lens. Come on. The lens of God being a God of abundance. And your life being filled with His blessing and with His abundance. And get rid of just a lack mentality. Come on. So it says, well, I don't really need much in life. You know, I, you can, that, if it's, you, you, that's your attitude, Pastor. That's great. I just, I'm just one of those that's just not, I'm just easy to satisfy and don't need a lot to get by. You're selfish is what you are because all you are thinking about is you. You're for no more. You don't realize that, but that really is not a statement of humility. It's just a statement of you thinking about yourself. And it's not the covenant God has with you that you just have enough to get by and make heaven your home. And it'll all be worth it all when you get there. It will be, but that's not what life has to be like right now. God blesses you. So that you can be a blessing. Every, amen. Everybody say grapes. grapes. Now everybody say giants. giants. So there are grapes in the land. Abundance of grapes. But there are also giants in the land of the grapes. Verse 28. However the people who dwell in the land. Now remember they said. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's, here's the fruit thereof. That's the positive. But. However, the people who dwell in the land, they're strong. Their cities are fortified and they're very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negeb. Uh, Negeb however you say that. <laughs> the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and all the otherites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. And in verse 33, they say, there we saw the giants. They saw giants there. So there's always giants. Listen to me. As your pastor, you got to know this. Told you just about God's abundance and how God wants you to realize that. But what you have to understand is that there are always giants that stand between you and God's blessing and that abundance. Isn't that right? There are giant-sized problems, giant-sized challenges that you kind of brought with you, if you think about it, into your new life in Christ. You're saved, you're new. You got new life, but you got some old problems to deal with. Yeah. And those have to be conquered as big as they can seem, as bad as they can seem. Those have to be conquered, defeated, if you're going to enjoy the life that God has for you. Life always takes you into the land of giants. Serving God always takes you into the land of giants. Ministry, doing the work of the Lord, always takes you into the land of the giants. And if you want to get to the grapes, you've got to defeat the giants. Now, I don't know what your giant is. I know what my giants have been over the past. I've faced a lot of giants, as I'm sure all of you have. But again, maybe your giant today is a health issue. I know for a fact some of you are facing a real giant when it comes to your health. Some of you are facing financial issues. That I'm, It's your giant. It's really, it's huge. It stands before you right now. But there are others. The giant you're facing is in your marriage. It's in your family. You got, you got big issues there right now. And in others, it's in your career. It's in your business. You just have hit a big time obstacle that is threatening the success of your business. 
the future of your business. And you know what? I get that. That is how life rolls, isn't it? Amen? But how many of you are glad today, even though there are giants out there, God gives us the ability to defeat the giants? Can I hear a good amen? Amen. So enjoying the life that God has for you, fulfilling the call of God on your life, is always going to take you into the land of the giants. And to get to the grapes in your life, you've got to defeat those giants. Amen. Look at your neighbor right now and just say, God has grapes for you. Now look at the one on the other side because you didn't pick them anyway. So you want to say, so look at them, look at the other neighbor on the other side, but you do have to defeat the giants to get to them. Amen. Verse 30, it says, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. Watch this. They're saying they're, they're, there's giants, they're big, they're bad, they're stronger than we are. They're, they live in fortified series, no, uh, cities. No way, no how. We're not able. But uh, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. Totally different attitude. And occupy it. And listen to what he says, we are well able. Well, which is it, guys? We are not able or we are well able. You can't both be right. Amen? Caleb is saying, listen, guys, I was there with you because he was. I saw the same giants you saw. I know there's opposition. And I realize that the opposition seems great to you. It does to me too. But I want you to know that we are well able to overcome them. You know, when Caleb makes that statement, he's not making that statement based on their ability as a people. They're, they've been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. They've been beaten down, trodden down. Their self-esteem is at, a, at, a, at, a, at an all-time low. I mean, they just couldn't think less and view themselves worse. Uh, are, are, are you following me? It's like many of us when we, we first come to Christ. But he's not viewing, he's not saying what he's saying based on that. He's saying what he's saying based on the promise that God has given them that they're going to go in and they're going to possess the land. And it's also based on what God's already done for them up to that point. Because if you think about it, God's brought them out of Egyptian bondage, miraculously. Can't go back and track all that, you know, the miracles that he did to bring them out. The frogs, the water turning into blood. Y'all remember all that? Firstborn, man, I mean big time stuff. And he brings them out with a mighty hand. They get to the Red Sea, nowhere to go. Looks like Pharaoh's army is going to, you know, hunt them down, kill them. And God parts the Red Sea. They walk across on dry ground. I mean, that's pretty, that's a pretty big deal, right? You think they might remember some of these things. I think I would remember the Red Sea if I'd been there. He fed them with manna from heaven. He brought water out of a rock. I mean, you just go on. There's a list there of all the things God did for the people before they got to the land of Canaan. You would think they would get it by now. You know, it really doesn't matter what we face because God is for us. And obviously, if God's for you, it just doesn't matter who's against you or what's against you in life. We are well able, amen? But that's not what they said. They said, we're not able. We're not able. Just look at us. We're just a mess. Amen? And I tell you, they were wrong. They said, we're not able. By the way, they didn't go in and possess the land. Someone says, well, see, that proves they're not able. No, it doesn't. Because Joshua and Caleb were the other two spies. They said, we are able. We're well able. And when that generation have said that, you know, we're not able. And by the way, don't ever join the church, the first church of the we be not able. Because all those people died off. That whole generation died off. And here's these two old men going in with the next generation, Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb gets in there and he says, hey, you remember that mountain I told you to want? Give me, I want to give me this mountain. At 80 years old, he's, he's taking mountains. Somebody says, Pastor, you're going to be taking mountains at 80. If I'm here, I'm taking mountains. Amen. Amen. Might be little mountain. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> One of the big mistakes, this is on the screen because I wanted you to see this statement. One of the big mistakes people make is to assume that if God wants me to have something, I won't have to fight for it. If it's the will of God, you ever hear this? If it's the will of God, it'll happen, and whatever happens is the will of God. You know, can I tell you, you need to read your Bible. Because first of all, the will of God doesn't always happen. 
But very often, in fact, more often than not, when the will of God happens, it's because somebody put up a fight. It's because somebody took ground. Amen? If you read your Bible, you're going to discover that taking ground, entering into what God has for us in our life, carrying out God's will always comes with a battle. Remember Jesus before he goes to the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sweats, as it were, great drops of blood. Sounds to me like there is a battle going on as to whether or not the will of God is going to be done or not. Amen? How many of you are glad he fought that battle and won? Listen, stop being such a sissy and a panty waist. Whatever. Put your big girl pants on. I'm trying to just think of all the phrases we use. Never mind, I better not use that one. But anyway, and realize we're well able. There's a battle to fight. Let us go up at once. Come on, we're well able. We can do this. We got marriage problems, but we can defeat them. We got a kid that's not serving God, but God will bring him around. Come on. We need a miracle here financially, but God is a miracle working God. I need healing, but last time I checked, he's still Jehovah Rapha. He's still the Lord who heals me. That's Bible, folks. That's not just good preaching. It's not just something to get excited about. It's something to live. And live it in the face of life challenges. Live it in the face of the giant that you face in your life. Sheila and I, listen, you've got to fight for your future. You have to fight for your future. Everybody say, you've got to fight for your future. <laughs> Sheila and I have had to fight for our marriage. Yes. We've had to fight for our family. We're doing that right now. Yeah, we're just doing it right now. Got it. Yeah, family is family. Family doesn't always work the way you want it to. Sometimes stuff happens in your family. Come on. And you just say, well, bless their hearts. Well, just, you know how it goes. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not writing a kid's life off or their destiny being any different than it was supposed to be anyway. Bless the eternal name of my God. Come on. Are you hearing me? My God is able to turn things around, to redeem that. And your latter end ends up being greater than anything you did in the past. Amen? Yeah, he just restores what the enemy has stolen. Yeah, and I hope my kid's listening right now. God's for you. And I'll guarantee you others are for you too. Amen? Amen? I can't tell you the number of times over the 44 years that this church has been here that we've had to fight for the future of our church and move our church forward. And sometimes that fight seemed too great for us. I'll just be real honest with you. It just seemed too great for us. We've had to fight some giant-sized problems. If you're going to enter the promised land and enjoy the life and the blessing of God in your life, you better be ready to fight. Come on, let's stop being Christianettes who show up on Sunday and, you know, just live like the world. And I don't mean in sin, but just live like we're just no different than anybody else. Man, we are different. We're the children of God. Amen? Not just one of these days, man, I'm a child of God right now, an heir of God right now, a joint heir with Jesus Christ right now now I don't need any of that when I get to heaven it's just there amen right now is when I need that joint heir stuff amen I'm a joint heir of his provision he's got it the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the cattle and all the people yeah so he can just he can get it to me Amen? If he needs to sell a cow for me, he can do it. For you, he'll do it. Amen? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, I better hurry. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Faith isn't just this laid back, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. I believed on Jesus 40 years ago and 
I've been in the way for 40 years now. And yes, you have. You have been in the way. Come on, it's not about, you know, just something I did 40 years ago. Faith is what I live by. And I don't just live by it when a challenge comes along. Faith is what I live by every day. And he says, fight the good fight. Can I tell you, I've had a few fights, not many. I don't like to fight. And uh, uh, the only fight I ever remember being a good fight was the ones I won. <laughs> Got the snot beat out of me, but I won. I did win, right? I don't ever remember getting my tail kicked and getting up saying, boy, that's a good fight. <laughs> yeah. I know there are guys out there like think like that. I'm not one. A good fight is a fight that you end up. Now, listen, it's not the end of the verse. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of. Another translation says, lay hold of the eternal life. We, we, we read that and we think he's talking about the life that is to come. And he is. The only thing is eternal life began the day you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Eternal life is the life of God. You don't wait till you get to heaven to take hold of that, to lay hold of that. You can lay hold of that right now. Lay hold of the life that God has for you right now. How do I do that? By fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. You have to fight to enter the promised land. You have to fight to take hold of the future that God has for you. And you have to fight your entire life. Some people get a little older and they just stop fighting. I'm 67. I haven't stopped fighting. My fighting has changed. I will be honest with you because I used to fight, you know, really it's primarily, I guess, a lot from what God was doing in my life. I find myself now far more fighting for the next generation than I am doing anything. I have people who will tell me in this church, I've had this statement made, well, I've done my part. If you are still breathing, you should still be doing your part. Your part is not done until you've fought your fight, you've finished your course, and you've kept the faith all the way till the end. If you're breathing, if you put vapor on the mirror, fog on the mirror, how many know God still has need of you? And use for you. Amen. So the 10 other surprise response was the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people for they're stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that spied out saying the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are a great height. There, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from these giants. And watch this, watch this phrase. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Everybody say grapes. grapes. Everybody say giants. giants. Then everybody say grasshoppers. grasshoppers. Yeah, grasshoppers. Every time I use that phrase, I think of kung fu. <laughs> Please. Kung fu. Do you even know what kung fu is? <laughs> if you can snatch the pebbles from my hand. Yeah, thank you for bringing me some water. <clears throat> Don't you wish you had a black glass of water right now? <laughs> so, everybody say grasshopper. You know what? On the screen, a grasshopper mentality is what these people had, and a grasshopper mentality will always keep you out of the promised land. And there are so many people in the body of Christ who have a grasshopper mentality. Life's so big, life's so bad, the devil's so bad, he's so evil, and just little old me out here trying to make it. That's grasshopper thinking. The greatest threat, think about this, to the promised land was not the giants. Because mm -mm. 40 years later, their kids went in, defeated those giants, and possessed the land. The greatest threat to the promised land wasn't the giants. It was the grasshopper mentality of the people. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. How do they know that? Did they go up to those giants and say, hey, 
We kind of feel like grasshoppers compared to you guys. What do you think? Do you think we're grasshoppers? Come on. Do you know you just impose, you know, you have this bad self-image, and then you just impose what you think everybody else thinks and, you know, what you, what you feel like about life in light of that. Isn't that right? Hey, I had no idea. Did you know the people that lived in that land were actually afraid of the Israelites coming into the land? Do you know why? Because they had heard about God bringing them out of Egyptian bondage, parting the Red Sea, feeding them with manna, bringing water out of rock. They heard about that and they all knew, we don't have a chance. Come on. But they saw themselves as grasshoppers. I bet you there are a few people in here today that see themselves as grasshoppers. People don't see things as they really are. They see things as as they are. So in other words, life is like a mirror. And all life does is reflect back to you how you see yourself. And if you're going to defeat the giants in your life, you're going to have to change the way you see yourself. We talk about this all the time. Just seeing yourself in Christ. Because that's who you are now. The old man is dead. There's, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You need to see yourself in Christ. Man, that means something. And it doesn't just mean I'm saved and going to heaven. You need to see yourself in Christ. Everything that is in Christ, you need to see that in yourself. You need to see yourself as a child of God and an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. You need to see yourself indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Greater is he who is in me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Anywhere I go, he goes. How do I know God is with me? Will you take him with you? In the person of the Holy Spirit. Somebody says, how does that work? I don't know. I don't, I don't have to know. I don't know how gravity works, but I know if I jump off, off my house, I'm going to probably break a leg. Because how many know I'm not going up? I'm coming down. Do I need to know how it works? No, I just need to know it works. Right? Yeah. I'm indwelt by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Wherever I go, Holy Spirit goes with me. And greater is he... When I need him, which is all the time, when I need him, man, he rises up on the inside. Come on. Gives me courage. Gives me boldness. Gives me the words that I'm to speak according to the writings of John. Come on. I can do all things. How? Through Christ who strengthens me. That's how. You got to see yourself as God being for you. God being with you. God being in you. God always working on your behalf. Yeah, taking all things, working them together for your good. See yourself as able. See yourself as more than a conqueror. Amen? Absolutely. God has grapes for you. But there are giants in the land. And you have to conquer the giants if you're going to eat the grapes. What stopped these people from entering the promised land is exactly the same thing that stops so many from entering into the good things that God has for us in that our lives. And it isn't the giants. It's the way we see ourselves. We see ourselves way too often as grasshoppers. Amen? Don't let a grasshopper mentality rob you of your future. I want to end this morning. This was supposed to be a one and done. It'll be a two and done, maybe. (laughs) Here's what I want you to say with me. Everybody say, the grapes grapes are reachable. The The giants are defeatable. And I'm no grasshopper. (laughs) Come on. Amen? Say it again. The grapes are reachable. The The giants are defeatable. defeatable. And I'm no grasshopper. grasshopper. Woo! Come on. Next week, I want to talk to you about laying hold of your future. Does that sound good?